Welcome to the Midlife Men podcast with me, Philip Briscoe. Today I'm joined by Brian Murphy. Brian's going to talk to us about his experiences of, of mental health, particularly around depression, and his he'll talk through his journey. And I won't try to do that for him. So welcome, Brian. Thanks. Thanks for having me, Philip. So Brian, perhaps, and I, and I start this uh, start each podcast with the same sort of question: where, where do things begin? Do you want to pick up where where your story starts? Sure. I'm a 52 year old married father of two, teenage, uh, one boy, one girl. I've been in Minnesota, St. Paul, Minnesota, or Minneapolis, the Twin Cities, for about 24 years. Prior to that, I, I grew up and uh, was raised and educated in Detroit, Michigan, and got into newspaper journalism uh, right out of college and at the uh, my local paper, the Detroit Free Press, became was a news and sports reporter, moved to Minnesota in 2000 to cover an expansion hockey team the Minnesota Wild, an NHL hockey team. That was kind of my passion. Wanted to be a hockey journalist. I was able to find a great hockey market and an opening to kind of let me fulfill my uh, my sports writing dreams. And it was, it was fantastic. I, I did it for uh, 15 plus years. And in the meantime, I had gotten uh, married. I married a, fe- a fellow journalist, my wife, Megan, in 2007. We had two children. And by about 2017, 2018, I started feeling sort of the effects of what I know now were, were low level depression and wasn't sure how to, how to tackle it at that time. And I didn't tackle it very well. And it sort of slowly and surely just kind of enveloped me. And, and, you know, I ended up being hospitalized twice and once in 2017 and once in early 2019 throughout a couple of depressive episodes that's just the the 50,000 foot overview. Uh, the last five years, I've been in a pretty good space. I pivoted away from sports journalism. I'm a freelance writer now, but also a uh, corporate communications and marketing specialist. So I've kind of gotten the nine to five adult job, as it were, since uh, leaving sports journalism in the toy department five years ago. What my journey started with and is continues with is um, kind of identity that identity as a uh, as a working professional and as a professional father and spouse and somebody who I think was probably defined more by his job than should have been. And I was able to recognize that and uh, make some course corrections, both in my just sort of in my mental health care, uh, self-care, and also just um, reprioritizing my professional and personal life and, and what what gives me satisfaction. And uh, I've come to kind of put my job as a secondary element to that and try to uh, try to connect a little bit more with my, my children's schedules and their activities and being a lot more present, both physically present because I'm not traveling for work anymore, but also mentally present in taking in um, real-time experiences as opposed to kind of always wondering what's next and how are we going to afford that? And how am I going to be able to accomplish this? And what is it going to say if I'm not doing this by this particular age? I've kind of radical acceptance is something we can get into. And I just feel like that's what's been carrying the day for the last several years for me. So going back to um, to when you first started experiencing what, what you then found out to be kind of low-level depression, could you kind of share the you know, what were the symptoms, if you like, you know, how, how were, how was it manifesting in your daily life? It was really a a lack of satisfaction and fulfillment in what I was doing professionally, but also I could see myself not being present and I could see myself not appreciating and enjoying social moments. I'm an extrovert by nature. I've always been sort of somebody that can carry on a conversation, loves to have a drink with friends. I found myself battling just to sort of be to be present and how exhausting that became. It got to the point where I really didn't want to socialize. I didn't want to be doing what I was doing professionally. I didn't want to be going to school events. I didn't want to be going to um, dinners with friends. I kind of wanted to just crawl into a hole. And what that hole became for me was bed. When it really got bad, I had a hard time getting out of bed and just, just facing an average day. And it was this, I think, real deep self-awareness that I had that I was depressed. I couldn't figure out why I was depressed because I had so many things going for me. There was no single event or tragedy that would have triggered anything. It was uh, it was my inability to come to terms with the fact that I was sick and I needed to do something about it. it wasn't healing on its own, and being self aware about how 
depressed I was and unable to kind of find the tools to tackle that drove me into deeper depression. And I think that's in some ways, I'm sure others can relate to this. It's a cycle. You're depressed. You don't know why you're depressed, which makes you more depressed. And uh, I was kind of flailing around there for for a while and really uh, just not appreciating what was around me and the benefits that I did have in life. And I think those were some of the darker darker thoughts that I really had to confront is if I'm not satisfied being Brian Murphy, the sports journalist who succeeded and done this for so long, then really, who am I? Well, turns out I'm a lot more than that. Did you share how you were feeling with anybody at the time? I mean, certainly my wife knew where I was at. Uh, I was seeing a therapist. I did have some friends that I could confide in. Problem is, um, you know, they're long distance friends, they're long term friends, but long distance friends. And, you know, it, 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 it's very difficult for people who are not anxious, do not suffer from depression or anxiety to grasp why somebody else feels that way because it's an emotional reaction. Anybody can relate to, oh, you've got cancer. That's horrible to hear. We're here for you. Put your bandana on and fight the good fight as you lose your hair and, and are tackling this insidious physical disease that everybody is familiar with and can relate to and maybe has a has a loved one that has gone through that before. There's sort of a camaraderie and a community in that. With mental health, though, there's either a combination of shame or an inability to understand or grasp what may be happening with somebody. And, you know, they're really just, there are some physical manifestations. I mean, for me, I'd lost some weight and was just more withdrawn, but it's harder to understand somebody that's suffering from severe depression, what they're going through, because there just isn't that outward obviousness to it. And it's, uh, so to me, it had to be, it had to be more professional and it had to be more finding, uh, folks that were going through similar things, particularly men who are going through depression. And I found, I found community in that here in the twin cities. And that is one of the major tools that have, has helped me manage and, and progress, uh, over the last several years. And was this, are we talking about the Face It Foundation here? Correct. Yes. In uh, suburban Minneapolis here. I've been associated with them about six years now, uh, which slightly predated my second hospitalization. But I've been going to uh, every other week uh, group sessions uh, with fellow middle-aged men who are suffering through depression. And we're not a therapeutic group. We're a support group. We're kind of a listening post. And uh, it's been one of the strongest uh, tools in my toolbox uh, that I've been able to develop over the last several years. And how did you how did you find the organization? It was a fellow writer in town who was had been going to several of these meetings probably for a year or two at that time. I knew him in mutual professional circles, and he suggested uh, you may want to reach out to this organization. I know Mark Meyer, and I know what he's about. And I know there may be some openings coming up soon and some, some group sessions. It may be something you want to explore. And, um, I've been forever grateful for that, uh, sort of ubiquitous moment because it would have not been something I would have been able to probably find on my own. And so, you know, there's, there's a a kind of camaraderie is that, you know, you said it's a, it's more of a support group than a therapy group. Um, you know, did, did you find it quite easy to open up and, and share your experiences? I did. And that's just in my nature, but there's, there's power in a shared experience. And especially for men, uh, it's the reason face it was founded was because the suicide rate for middle-aged men is, is among the highest in, in the, the demographics of those that are either taking their own lives or suffering. There's a, um, there's a reluctance. Uh, it's the male macho image. It's uh, not wanting to uh, acknowledge that you may not be as mentally strong as you're expected to be. Um, there's a sense that, you know, if you're the patriarch of a family or the breadwinner uh, professionally, that you're failing. You're failing yourself. You're failing your your spouse, your children. You're failing your family. And there's really no probably more emasculating experience than feeling like you're you're failing your family. But it's it you're not a failure you're a human being who's suffering and there are there's i've always told new p- folks that have come into our group um that maybe in various stages of whether recovering or spiraling or just trying to find answers the hardest thing to do is to come to a meeting but once you're there i've never felt i always feel great when i leave whether i felt bad going into a meeting or just felt like 
somebody else was able to open up and I was able to share my personal experience. I always feel better. It's the hardest thing for some guys to do to just come to our six o'clock Tuesday meeting. But I always say, if you do that and you leave at eight o'clock, you're going to feel better about yourself, not only for making the decision to come, but also kind of through osmosis, the experience of having others who can share and empathize. It's very powerful. So going back to what you were saying earlier, where you were withdrawn, withdrawing yourself from your, you know, your social life, uh, you just wanted to kind of stay in bed. I'm interested in what, what was the, what was the tipping point? At what point did you think I need to do something about this? And, and what did you do? I just felt like there was, um, I wanted to uh, surrender. I wanted to surrender to people and professionals that could help me. And for me, that meant two partial hospitalizations. I mean, there was one in uh, December of 2017 um, for a couple of days where I literally bottomed out and found myself in hospital scrubs and behind closed doors in a mental health facility. That also opened up opportunities to find out avenues to tackle this treatment and care, finding something trying different uh, levels of both talk therapy, uh, medications, and other therapeutic solutions. And it was kind of trial and error for a bit because and I was able to, uh, to bounce back from that experience. I took a leave of absence from work, went back to work and felt pretty good, tweaked some medications, had a pretty good run for a while. But by early 2019, uh, I decided to take a buyout from my newspaper here for a variety of reasons, just mostly financial Anybody that knows how the newspaper industry is creating, uh, cratering around the globe would understand. It was time for me to to kind of pivot professionally, and uh, that also sent me on a little bit of a spiral again in early 2019 because it was an identity crisis at that point. Who am I if I'm not the person I wanted to be since I was 13 years old? So that was an even deeper, deeper experience where I was hospitalized again. Went through some some more. Uh, medication uh, modifications, deeper talk therapy. I was able to come out the other end on that one. I think I think I was a little more humbled this time around than the first hospitalization. I think kind of bottoming out and having everybody take care of you for a while maybe gives you a false sense of security. I didn't really utilize the tools that I was given to manage my mental health. I maybe thought, oh, this is over. The worst is over you know, it's like any disease, it's, it's going to linger. You have to treat it. Um, I call it my dark passenger. It's, it's there. And even today there are mornings I wake up and I can feel him lurking a little, but I also have the self-awareness, I think in the, and the right tools and the attitude to, to confront that fear, to confront that anxiety and manage it as opposed to letting it envelop me. And I think that's the biggest difference from the 2019 hospitalization and the 2017 hospitalization is that I, I now recognize the tools that I have at my disposal and I've been using them effectively. What, I mean, if you can, perhaps you could explain a bit more about, about the tools, you know, how do you, in that situation where, you know, and mental health is a, is a continuum, it's ongoing and it flows and ebbs as you've been describing, but when you've got these tools, how do you actually use them? Especially if you start to think, well, I'm, I'm kind of going down, you know, I'm going down into perhaps a bit of a chasm and, and put the brakes on that. I think sharing, sharing those anxieties, whether it's in my group, uh, whether it's with my psychiatrist or whether it's with my wife is acknowledging today, I'm not feeling that great about things. And for me right now, the anxieties that are triggering me is I'm unemployed. I, I had my corporate job for the last two years. I was laid off in April so financially, we're doing fine right now. Uh, that's not going to last forever. So I'm trying to transition to, into another corporate role. So there's been some lingering anxieties about how long this has taken and, and the uncertainty of where the next five to 10 years are going to be for my earning potential as my kids enter college years. So there's been a couple of times where I've woken up feeling not less than adequate, let's put it that way. But I've been able to power through because Attacking the day is, is, is the most important thing for me. Getting out of bed, acknowledging my anxieties, some of which are legitimate, some of which may not be, some of which may perpetuate themselves into a lot of negative self-talk self that, that really isn't 
true, let alone unproductive. So I feel like talking about it. And again, talking about it with the people that know my story, know my narrative, not allowing myself to surrender, which is what I was doing in 2017 and 2019, which was giving in and allowing myself to spiral. I haven't been on the verge of of any kind of a collapse in five years, but I felt the negative energy and I felt the negative vibes. And I've been able to kind of acknowledge them, accept them and manage them. And that's been the biggest, the biggest difference for me is coming out of those two, those two dark episodes is feeling like I'm more in control of this than letting my disease control me. And and this sense of identity that you talked about, do you now see yourself more than just, uh, you know, based on your profession? Do, does that help now that you see yourself uh, as a you know, husband and a father and a member of society? It does. It, it, it really, yeah, it really does. Because, I mean, what, well, what made my profession as a sports journalist unique was um it was a uniquely fulfilling and exciting and exhilarating and you know monday was always different from tuesday and wednesday was always different from tuesday and thursday and it made it made that i know a lot of my male friends and family loves talking about what i was doing and where i was going and what my next assignments would be and it was interesting um but then it became a job and then it became a job i didn't like anymore and then it became a job that wasn't paying as well as i should be earning at this particular point in my life and i realized this isn't what i mean i'm a husband i'm a father i'm a friend I, we have a very rich social circle both in my hometown in michigan and also here in minnesota these are the things that i need to enjoy and gain fulfillment from most people don't necessarily like their jobs and most people try not to define themselves by their jobs. And I'm at the point, uh, you know, again, in my early fifties where I'd rather take a boring, uh, uh, sort of, uh, check the box type of job where I could earn more and stress less and then enjoy sort of the fruits of, uh, my real life a little bit more. And I've come to, uh, to the point where I'm not interested in climbing a ladder per se. I'm not interested in becoming uh, an executive anywhere. I'm not, I'm not interested in managing a team of, of people. I'm interested in doing a job, doing it well, and being able to unplug it from that at four thirty or five o'clock every, every weekday and not have to, um, not have to travel, not have to be up till midnight, not have to be wondering what calamity I'm going to be dealing with the next day. Um, I've kind of come to the point where I've accepted my profession as a means to living life as opposed to being the driving force behind it. And I've, I've spoken to many men actually who, who, you know, re- reflect what you're saying, actually, who mirror what you're saying. And in fact, I can relate to that myself. Um, and it's so important, isn't it, to be more than just your profession, to have other interests, because the moment that job is not there, then as you've been saying, you know, who, who are you? And uh, how do you kind of justify yourself? Um, perhaps we could talk a bit about the um, the, the article that you wrote that, that um, got so much interest. Yeah. So I believe uh, in March of 2019 or 2018, I believe it was, uh, the publication I worked for, the St. Paul Pioneer Press, also known as TwinCities.com digitally, encouraged me. I was a columnist at the time. So I'd been writing about a lot of other people's personal stories, athletes, executives, uh, coaches, kind of digging into what defines them beyond their exploits on the field. And I thought, well, if I can do that for others, why can't I tell my own story? And I had some editors who encouraged me to do so after my initial hospitalization in December of 2017. So I, I, about three months later, when I was about ready to come back from my leave of absence, um, I did write a first person account kind of chronicling a lot about what we talked about, the spiral, the inability to halt it, the feeling of lost, being lost and, and, and failing your family and, and just how stark that feeling is when you hear those doors close behind you. Um, and you know, you're miles away from home emotionally and, um, spiritually and mentally. And to be able to kind of chronicle that, and share that story. Um, I knew it would resonate. I didn't realize how deeply it would resonate, uh, with the audience. And 
I had a couple of um, mentors reach out to me and say, this might be the most important story you've ever written. And I was able to, I think being able to connect um, either in comments or emails after writing that with um, folks that were going through similar situations and appreciated me sharing my story so bluntly. I mean, it it didn't feel that much of a risk to me. And I, I didn't feel like I was, I mean, I was certainly being vulnerable, but I felt like, you know, having bottomed out like that and kind of recognized where I was and where I was failing and where I needed to, to improve, where I needed to build self care tools and acknowledge I'm depressed and it's not, that doesn't define who I am. It was very fulfilling to do that and connect with others. And I also feel like I was obligated as somebody who writes and chronicles and criticizes those in the public realm. Um, why not use my, my talents as a writer to explain my story. So that's what drove that. And I was really blown away by, by how deeply it resonated with the audience. And, and, um, you know, I had people that work for teams in town come up to me and say, Hey, I really appreciate you writing that. My mother's been going through this. Um, I had a spouse, uh, that was in a bad place. And I think what you wrote about touched upon it and it humanized it. And, you know, I was, you know, there was a lot of gratitude uh, to be a part of something like that. But as it turns out, I wasn't done working on myself because two years later I was back in the hospital. So I may have thought by bottoming out and writing about it that I had kind of punched my ticket to uh, normal living as it were. But then I've, I've come to realize there's nothing normal about being depressed, but it doesn't make you abnormal either. And from what you're saying then, it's, um, it's a kind of, constant thing that needs to be managed ongoing there's no ultimate cure or you, you can't turn around and say well i used to have depression i'm absolutely fine now uh, you, you find that it's it's a constant work in progress it is and it, sometimes you don't know when it's gonna when it's gonna rear it doesn't necessarily mean you, you you find yourself in a bad place and then it it rears its head there are sometimes i wake up and i wonder why why do i feel like this today what what is triggering this and then instead of scrambling to find a reason and a root cause, I just sort of acknowledge it, address it, and progress with my day. And maybe I'm not going to have a great experience, but at least I'm not allowing it to control me. And I think that's the biggest thing I've been able to do in the last five years is recognize the symptoms when they arise. If I don't know the root cause of it, that's okay. But just know that the person that I was the night before is the person I really am. And I'm not going to allow whatever is triggering this latest mental health hiccup. I'm not going to allow that to take me down a path where I'm just a a dysfunctional human being. Do you think it's things are changing? Do you think, uh, I mean, people will still suffer, you know, depression, uh, but do you think as a as a general society we're normalizing it more you know for example the article you wrote you got a lot of feedback saying how you know how how thankful people were that you'd you'd expressed it uh in a kind of very public way but do you think things are changing is it easier now is it is it a more caring society we live in i wouldn't i wouldn't characterize america in 2024 as very caring right now we're it's a very awkward period for a variety of reasons i'd say two things though when i come to think of that have i think taken the edge off or at least reduced the stigma of mental health one there are a number especially here in the states i'm not sure about the uk there are a number of professional athletes high profile athletes that have gone public with their mental health struggles, whether it's affected their performance on the field or whether it's affected their relationships off them. There have been more, I mean, I think globally you could think of Simone Biles, uh, the the U.S. gymnast who, of course, struggled in Tokyo uh, with mental blocks and was savaged, but also empathized with on social media. And her comeback story this year in Paris she has a platform and a lot of these professional athletes realize they have platforms much larger than mine where they can share their struggles and normalize themselves and their struggles. And I think that connects to a lot of different people. And I think that's been much more, you you know, you'll hear about a baseball player who took a day off for mental health reasons that didn't happen 10 or 15 or 30 years ago. And he, 
professional athlete who takes a day off for mental health reasons may not have a job the next day. But today, it's recognized more. And I think there's more empathy out there that high-profile, well-compensated, highly skilled professional athletes are human beings just like the rest of us. And depression spares no one. I also think the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic, I think, impacted people too. I think a lot of people became very introspective during that period of time. And I was very cognizant of of not allowing the sudden shutdown of life and, and all of us kind of crawling into our own realms. I wanted to make sure that that didn't trigger anything with me. So I was on heightened awareness about what impacts being stuck inside for months at a time as this pandemic raged. I think a lot of people I think it turned everybody inward a bit and everybody dealt with it in different ways, professionally, personally, domestically, financially. We made different decisions uh, that we felt would benefit ourselves or our families, but we were all confronted with a little bit of our mortality and also having to kind of live with ourselves because we really couldn't escape for months at a time. I think that, I think that may have softened the edge a little bit because it certainly triggered a lot of mental health problems in people who were in, uh, stuck inside and and that lack of human contact, I think it brought a lot of mental health issues to the forefront. So I'd like to think today in 2024, we're in a better place about empathizing with people that do have mental health issues, but uh, we're a long way from being uh, uh, as accepting as we may be for for other physical, more well-known ailments. Yeah, I I think you're right. I think... um... The COVID episode did force everybody to have to had to take an inward look, as you said, which um, you know, which perhaps did soften the edges a bit. Yeah, and suffering alone, I I, I I can empathize because there's really nowhere to escape mental illness. I mean, it is it's going to follow you wherever you go. You may think a job change, a partner change, a geographic change; these things are not going to allow you to escape yourself and escape from your own vulnerabilities or your own harsh judgments of yourself. It takes self-work. It takes acknowledging and it takes self-work and it takes a commitment to it. And as you're right, I mean, if you're suffering alone and you don't have a support network around you that A, is going to recognize that and maybe encourage you to seek help or B, you're just too ashamed to share it, you're going to suffer alone. And suffering alone is the worst place you can be because you're in depression attacks your your brain in a way that makes it hard to rationalize and it makes it hard to understand you need to let yourself go and put yourself in the care of others who may not be able to solve everything today but who can offer solutions and opportunities and tools that'll help you manage your symptoms and come to terms with wherever you're at at that particular moment in life and if you're, you know, if you are living with or married to or related to or working with somebody you think is, is, you know, is suffering, uh, perhaps they haven't recognized it or they're, you know, just, just, you can see the symptoms, maybe they can't. What advice would you give to people who just want to try and do something, but, you know, perhaps they're not sure what? I would say, you know, that empathy is key, but you can't be an enabler either. Um, Empathy only goes so far because empathy is about understanding. But if you're not able to convey to to a loved one that their their symptoms and their behaviors are negatively affecting um, you in a particular way, it's 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 difficult to really bring somebody to the table. Um, they have to be able to do it themselves, and the best thing I think you can do is try to empathize with how somebody's feeling, but also express this is the way your behavior is affecting our situation. And it does need to be addressed and how that's addressed, where that's addressed and how aggressively that's addressed. I mean, that's for person, the spouse, the caregiver and, and, uh, professionals to come in and express that. But I, I think there, you know, it's, it's not a comfortable topic and, you know, much like substance abuse. I mean, you don't necessarily want to confront somebody who's an alcoholic that they may be an alcoholic, but there are ways to convey 
how those behaviors are impacting your life in particular and how with, you know, there needs to be an acknowledgement and there also needs to be a plan set forward. The best way to do that is to validate somebody's feelings, empathize with them, but also challenge them, I think. And that's what my wife did to me in no uncertain terms, not, not necessarily threat of divorce per se, but we can't go on like this. You can't go on like this. What are you prepared to do about it? Those are the kinds of stark choices that sometimes need to be, you know, confronted on somebody. And maybe that is something that may help somebody acknowledge that this isn't just a passing fad. This is something I need to, to address and drill into, or it's going to consume me. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, it's not a, as you just said, it's not an easy topic. It's not necessarily filled with humor. Um, but nevertheless, it's really, really important, I think, that you know, people like yourselves are, are, are very willing to, to open up and, and, and try and normalize uh, you know, your experience with, with depression and really hoping that people listening to this who might be affected can, can take some guidance from, from you. So thank you, Brian, for, for taking time to talk to us today. No, it's my pleasure. I mean, it's, no, no, it's not one size fits all. Everybody has to kind of find their their own way through the journey, as it were. Um, find the right tools, find the right acceptance, but you're not alone. And it doesn't make you less of a person or a man because you're suffering. That's kind of the prevailing uh, message I'd like to get out there. Thank you for listening to the Midlife Men podcast with me, Philip Briscoe. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, the Face It organization can be found at faceitfoundation.org. Or you can email Mark at info at faceitfoundation.org. There are also organizations you can call now. For example, in the UK, you can call the Samaritans on 116123. And if you're listening in the US, you can call the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. If you have a story to tell and you think your experience would help others, then please get in contact with me, either by the website, mid-lifemen.com, or email me at midlifemen01 at gmail.com. Finally, please share the podcast with people you know and with your networks. And if you enjoy listening, then please rate or like the podcast. It helps raise its profile and helps reach more people who might benefit from the stories shared by my guests.